Want to call the City of Geneva Committee of the Whole meeting to order. My name is Mary Sino. I represent the third ward along with Dean Kilberg. I'd like to let the record show that um, the only alderman missing tonight is Alderman Brown. I'd like to uh, move to consider the consent agenda, which is to approve the minutes from March 2nd, 2015 and March 9th, 2015. So moved. Second. Marks and Cummings. And then our first item of business. You have to give a oh, vote. We need a voice vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. Our first item of business is the oath ceremony for police officer Michael Walker. Is Mr. Walker here? Mr. Walker, <laughs> welcome. May I turn your microphone on? We understand you were delayed by a train. Yes, sir. So, so what was the route you took instead of waiting for the train? Yes. I went back on to 20 and yeah. went around to Dunham. Did, did you speed? Fine. Did you speed? <laughs> no, good. No. I didn't have enough time. So we've got county authority here. We've got city authority here. This is huge. So. And an attorney. And, and the attorney, yeah. But I've got a little cheat sheet here about you. Would you mind terribly if I shared with everyone present tonight a little bit about yourself? And hi. This is cool, man. Michael L. Walker. Yes. What's the L stand for? Lee. Lee. Yes. I like it. Let's see. Is Jennifer with you tonight? Yes, she is. Where's Jennifer? Hello, Jennifer. How are you? Good. How are you? Welcome. Thank you. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Devin Walker, age nine, could not make it tonight. Is that correct? Okay. Are your parents with us? My mom is. Excellent. Evelyn's here? Mm -hmm. Where's Evelyn? Way, way in the back. <laughs> how are you, Evelyn? Welcome. Thank you. And thank you in advance for buying all of us dinner later tonight after the ceremony. <laughs> Very generous. Let's see. You live in Streamwood, Illinois. Yes, sir. Hey. You graduated from Northern <laughs> Illinois University with a degree in criminology and a minor in psychology. You're pursuing a master's degree at Argosy University in forensic psychology. What is forensic psychology? It, it would take a, a little bit of time to explain everything that well, goes into it. We're paid by the hour, so it's take us. <laughs> well, I know you guys got a lot to do, so I don't want to hold you up. But it's pretty cool, whatever it is, right? Yeah. That's not silence. Now, yeah. <laughs> you know, we had we swore in an officer a couple weeks ago, and this gentleman has similar interests, or I should say love, that you do. Huge Bears, Bulls, Blackhawks, and White Sox fan. Ooh. Yes. Why do we keep hiring? Why do we keep hiring White Sox fans? <laughs> Why are you a White Sox fan? Born on the south side of Chicago. No kidding? I was there when they were red, white, and blue. So. Oh, my God. Whoa, that that wasn't. So you remember Kittle? Oh, a little bit. A little bit. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> you enjoy all types of movies, but still do not have a favorite movie. That is correct. No favorite movie? No. Jennifer, None. Are you, are you like a, do you like the chick flicks or do you like the action stuff or? Everything. 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 Do you go to the theater or are you a Netflix a guy? Lot. Yeah, we go to the theater a lot. Really? Mm -hmm. The chairman just said you look like a sound of music kind of guy. <laughs> it's like. I don't sing myself, but I <laughs> like musicals. I can get down with that. I like that. <laughs> Something else that people might find interesting about you. Now, this is pretty cool, man. My sister-in-law is also a state champion. In high school, you won the state championship two years in a row in the triple jump. Yes, sir. Wow. That's pretty cool, man. F which high school? Kiwani High School. Kiwani, really? Now, just getting the steps down in the triple jump is half the battle. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's amazing, man. What's, what's the distance? Uh, 46, 3, and some change. Wow. Do you still hold the record? At my high school, I do. You do? Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool, man. You walked onto the football team at NIU. Mm -hmm. This is the best pair. Listen to this, guys. But chose not to remain on the team once I proved that I could make it. <laughs> <laughs> so the coach said, you're a heck of a guy, Mr. Walker. And you said, <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> did, did you triple jump off the field when you left, or did you? I, I walked off. What position? Receiver. Receiver. So solid hands? Decent hands, yeah. Decent hands? Oh, just decent hands. Yeah. Yeah? Do your hands come in handy for the triple jump? Not at all. Not at all. They're behind you. 
Or on my side. Yeah, well, you know. Sigma Phi Epsilon fraternity as well as student government while at college. Good Lord, man. You were boring, weren't you? Student government? Yeah, for like a year and a half. Oh, did you walk out of that too? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, was, I gave it up. Uh, like the first year, I actually saw uh, someone get impeached, so that was pretty interesting. So it wasn't boring. Really? Yeah. And this is perhaps most impressive. You served in the U.S. Coast Guard from 2004 to 2008. Yes, sir. And where were you stationed? Galveston, Texas. Galveston. Wow. What do you think of the spring snow we got here? This is good living, isn't it? <sighs> Makes me miss Texas a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I bet it does. Well, tr traditionally, any questions or comments for our soon-to-be new officer, Walker? Is there anyone else in the audience who'd like to introduce guests of yours, friends of yours? I have my neighbors back here. Uh, Ooh, look at that. Ray, Paul, little Mina, and their two-week-old daughter, Chloe. Who wow. <laughs> and, of course, you met Jennifer and my mom, Evelyn. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. Chief, anything you'd like to add regarding this uh, fine gentleman? And we have to swear you in tonight because tomorrow you start. Uh, power test. Well, yeah. I mean, academy's yeah. next Monday. The academy's next Monday. So you have to test all week, then off to the academy. And where's the academy held? Uh, Glen Allen. Oh, that's not a much of a trip, Chief. Over at College of DuPage, right? It's a beautiful facility. I haven't been there, so. It's gorgeous. Yeah? Yeah, okay. it's really nice, yeah. It, it's in like a little box. It's like... That's a joke, Officer Walker. That's, a, <laughs> that's DuPage County, man. It's a whole different world over there. It's like, traditionally speaking, our city clerk has the pleasure of administering the oath, but the city clerk is not with us tonight. So if you would not object, I'd love to administer the oath for you. Sure thing. And by all means, invite whomever you would like to stand with you during the administration of the oath. I'll go solo. I don't want to put any pressure on anyone else. Oh, heck, man. Jennifer, Mom, what do you think? It's up to you. Soon to be officer. Oh, mom's coming. Mom's, mom's coming. <laughs> Always have to still the spotlight. Oh, man. <laughs> Taking my thunder. Now, do you have brothers and sisters? Yeah. Uh, my sister's still at school. My brother had to work. Is that right? So, Evelyn, this is your favorite? Michael? <laughs> I don't have no favorite. <laughs> I keep them all the same. Smart move. Pleasure. Nice to meet you. Welcome. I'm here. Jennifer, welcome. Thank you. How about we do it up here? I know the officer would love a photo. So if you would like to join us up here, get this out of the way. <coughs> Jeez, man, the last two guys are the big guys. Yeah, what is 6'4"? 6'4". You play basketball too or no? What position? Four? Yeah, four. Yeah. Who are you cheering on the NCAA? Uh, I would like Wisconsin to do it. Yay! <laughs> 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 why, don't, why, don't, why don't you face kind of this way so everyone can see your beautiful face and Jennifer and Mrs. Walker. Okay, you ready to get? You all set, Hansen? I ask that you raise your right hand, please, and repeat after me. I state your name. I'm Michael Walker. Having been appointed to the office of police officer in the city of Geneva. In the county of Kane, aforesaid, do you solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Illinois and that I will faithfully discharge the duties of the office of police officer? You can say whatever you want, but don't think you want.
for our new police officer? We're going to show you how to get around those trains when you come to work. Yeah. Right. Did you know where Country Lane is in Streamwood? Yeah. That's where I grew up. Yeah? You did, really? That's pretty cool. Right down was dirt when they, they just, just, they just awesome. made Streamwood. Thank you. I just moved there, what, two years ago? Oh, yeah. Have fun this week. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. A big round of applause for... on the streets. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chairman. No problem. Actually, go ahead. Mm -hmm. So up next, we have a presentation by Stephen Zulkowski, uh, Kane County Department of Transportation, on the Randall Road Signalization Improvement Project. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, so I'm Steven Zolkowski. I'm the uh, new traffic and permitting engineer from Kane County Division of Transportation. Uh, I'm here to talk to you today about a new uh, traffic signal improvement project uh, that will be going into Randall Road uh, this summer. Uh, this Randall Road project will be from the intersection of Fabian Parkway up north to Silver, Grand, Silver Glen Road. Uh, so that'll include uh, the northern parts of uh, Batavia, Geneva, of course, uh, St. Charles, as well as South Elgin. So uh, I wanted to talk to you today primarily about uh, what flashing yellow arrows means, uh, because it's actually a new kind of traffic signal indication that's not been seen around uh, this area of Illinois. Uh, this type of signal has actually been in place uh, in Peoria, uh, or IDOT District 4, so down south, as well as in many adjacent states. Uh, so the purpose of this presentation is to uh, give you some exposures to what this uh, flashing yellow arrow means and give, some, give you some background information as to what uh, this Randall Road project incorporates uh, in addition to uh, this flashing yellow arrow. So. Some of the goals I want to cover today uh, is, of course, uh, where is it? As I mentioned, it's Randall Road uh, between Batavia up to South Elgin. Uh, primarily focusing on what is it, of course, uh, making sure everyone knows a bit more about what is flashing yellow arrow. Uh, and then, of course, cover why we're doing it, when it's going to happen, and, of course, how this will happen as you are commuting uh, to work every day. Uh, so, to kind of summarize this screen that's, uh, 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 I guess, in a, a, a nutshell, this one slide basically shows the difference between what a traditional traffic signal might look like uh, when you're going, say, northbound or southbound on Randall Road. Uh, you basically have the circular green indications. Uh, I have circled in a red box on the screens, kind of what you would see if you're just going straight through along the Randall Road corridor. Uh, just below that on the screens, you'll see that uh, there are two major differences between the series of signal heads on the bottom as it relates to the differences on the top. Uh, the differences, of course, being there is a flashing yellow indication uh, above the left turn lane uh, basically demonstrating that uh, with a yellow arrow um, that that will be new uh, in, in the traffic signal arrangement as well as uh, traffic signal heads being located in the center of travel lanes as opposed to uh, as you can somewhat see with the image above it's kind of related to the arrangement of signal heads on the lane lines of the travel lane so I guess taking a step back from the images why are we doing this? Uh, based on engineering uh, case studies and uh, both in the Illinois Department of Transportation as well as the Federal Highway Administration, these type of signal arrangements are 
shown to reduce crashes and are more easily understood to the everyday driver. Um, I guess at a glance, yellow basically uh, conveys to the everyday driver more of a yielding type of operation to, uh, I guess, generally convey that they do not have the right of way when they're trying to perform a left turn. They must first yield to oncoming traffic and pedestrians that may be in the intersection. Uh, uh, some of the other benefits to these kinds of traffic signal uh, flashing yellow indications is uh, when we are operating uh, the Randall Road under a less congested uh, off-peak periods, uh, we have opportunities to better improve traffic flow with um, changing when we use a protected left turn or a permissive left turn. Uh, so uh, I guess uh, uh, that's, sorry. So uh, that's the major differences between, I guess, a traditional traffic signal and a uh, flashing yellow aero traffic signal indication. Uh, on this page, we basically show that the Illinois Vehicle Code was one of the recent publications for Illinois legislature that allows for flashing yellow arrows to be used in the state of Illinois. Uh, for handout purposes, uh, this can be looked at uh, more in detail later. It basically just allows engineering projects to include this traffic signal arrow um, for future. Uh, talk more specifically about the Randall Road project, uh, but not necessarily about the flashing yellow indication, is what other types of things will be placed on Randall Road that will help improve safety uh, uh, up and down Randall Road. Uh, some of the improvements <coughs> will include flashing yellow arrow left turn signals, uh, better, better signal placement. Uh, as I had mentioned, uh, many of the traffic signal heads uh, for current are located more or less on the corners or the edge lane lines of traffic signal lanes uh, as opposed to in the future we plan to as part of this project put signal heads more above the center of the lanes uh, so the signal heads will be um, I guess more oriented above you as you're traveling past them uh, additionally we were looking to install driver feedback speed limit signs uh, these basically display two drivers as they're driving along Randall Road, what is your current speed as you go uh, past these signs? And of course, as we do uh, any traffic signal improvement, while we're doing improvements, we'll be updating any um, ADA sidewalk improvements. So as we have shown on the screens, those type of detectable warning type of panels, if they are not present at the intersections or they're not at current code, they will be <coughs> updated as part of that project. Uh, uh, something else that we're looking to do um, for every single signal head, we're looking to put uh, these type of traffic signal backplates uh, that I'm circling on the screen, uh, as well as any traffic signal backplate that is uh, on the master arms that cantilever over the intersections. We are looking to have these yellow boxes uh, displayed around traffic signals to help uh, increase the contrast of the traffic signals both in the daytime as well as at nighttime uh, to kind of show you an image of how significant uh, those type of yellow boxes might look like. Uh, this type of web page demonstrates what these yellow boxes might do as far as the easy, the ease of picking up on the, uh, I guess the visibility of these traffic signals as you're in both daytime and nighttime. So that's an example of what traffic signals may look like or will look like um, as part of this Randall Road project once they are constructed. Uh, it's, as far as budgeting is concerned, uh, it's a lot of words on this page. Uh, I guess the only thing we really need to know is that we uh, uh, acquired funds for this transportation project as part of uh, the Illinois Department of Transportation. Uh, there is a cost participation from the county at 10% local funds, while the uh, federal department highways contributes or IDOT contributes 90% of the cost of these improvements. So the county is actually getting quite a deal on all these uh, traffic signal improvements. So before I go too much farther, one of the key 
traffic signal terminologies I want to clarify is uh, when you're talking about flashing yellow arrows or uh, or left turning in general there's two different kinds of left turns you might see out uh, on any roadway and those two different <coughs> kinds of turns can be described as what is a permissive left turn which is basically a left turn uh, where you're allowed to turn left uh, but there's not it's not being conveyed by a green arrow which as rules of the roads convey that represents that oncoming traffic has the green light and you must first yield to cars as uh, they are approaching uh, whereas a protected left turn is typically represented by a green arrow uh, where you have the right of way to make your left turn and oncoming traffic has a red light so thus the idea of protected you not you uh, you have the ability to complete your turn without conflicting movements uh, so the significance of pointing out the differences between a permissive left turn and a protected left turn is that a flashing yellow arrow indication for this project will only impact intersections where you currently drive today that uses a permissive left turn uh, signal indication. Uh, here's another page that generally displays what a traffic signal might look like if it's using a per permissive only left turn or a protected permissive or a protected left turn. Uh, protected permissive is basically when traffic signal starts off protected. It uses its green arrow, goes to yellow when the protected phase ends, and then once uh, the protected phase ends, it just goes to a green circular indication uh, that allows you to complete left turns after uh, yielding to traffic in the opposing directions. Uh, before I go any further, one of the things I wanted to highlight as part of uh, this slide and many others, it, I have in the background a, a map of the entire project corridor uh, that shows little uh, yellow circles with an arrow in it that represent the intersections which will be using or demonstrating the flashing yellow arrow indication uh, once this project is completed. Uh, you will notice uh, this red box that I've shown here is basically the limits of uh, the city of Geneva or uh, township limits of, of Geneva. So uh, at many of the intersections where you do not see a flashing yellow type indication, uh, generally represents intersections that don't currently use a permissive left turn. Uh, so uh, as I've stated before, how you drive today will be the same way you drive once this project is completed. Flashing yellow arrow indication only impacts uh, what you see uh, in order to, I guess, drive the same way you drive today. <clears throat> So with all these words set aside, I, I believe and fully uh, think that the message of how flashing yellow arrow conveys traffic can best be demonstrated by a video, I guess more professionally demonstrated than my presentation here. So in the true fashion of a picture says a thousand words, I wanted to show this YouTube video. I'm Randy Lanning. That uh, basically covers what this flashing yellow arrow looks like and what it means to the everyday driver as they uh, as they see this indication. Traffic engineer for the Illinois Department of Transportation. We have been stalling flashing yellow arrows for left turns at signalized intersections. The reason we're doing this is for safety. Studies have shown that using the flashing yellow arrow instead of the circular green has greatly reduced left turn crashes. In addition to increasing safety at intersections, the flashing yellow arrow signal provides drivers with more opportunities to make left turns and provides traffic engineers with more options for handling variable traffic volumes. Here's a look at how these signals work. When the arrow is green, drivers wishing to turn left may proceed and make the turn. When the steady yellow arrow appears, drivers wishing to turn left should prepare to stop or prepare to complete the turn if they are legally within the intersection and there is no conflicting traffic present. When the arrow is red, drivers wishing to turn left must stop and wait. When the flashing yellow arrow appears, drivers wishing to turn left may proceed after yielding to traffic and oncoming pedestrians. Use caution while turning on a flashing yellow arrow 
as oncoming traffic has the green light. Flashing yellow arrow signals are being added to more than 100 intersections in Peoria and surrounding areas. Please drive safely at flashing yellow arrow intersections and at all times. All right, <clears throat> so that's a video that, of course, describes the flashing yellow arrow. Uh, I'll cover real quickly some slides that generally cover the signal sequence of a flashing yellow arrow. Uh, and of course, as the video described, the red arrow will still continue to mean stop for your left turns. Yellow, uh, of course, it warns traffic that light, the traffic light is about to turn red. Uh, and the green will continue to be allowing vehicles to con uh, make a protected left turn movement. So the only new indication is this flashing yellow arrow light. And it basically means the same thing as a circular green indication for left turns. Uh, it means you can make a left turn after first yielding to oncoming traffic and pedestrians in the intersection. Uh, so to quickly go through the signal sequence, as you were uh, a driver approaching an intersection, uh, of course red still means stop. In a protected permissive phase, if you were to turn left, the first indication that would come up would be a protected green. The protected phase would come to an end, letting you know that it's about to turn to red. It would stay red for a second or two. And of course, it would then allow for the permissive phase. It would let both traffic directions go, um, go green for the through movements. And as traffic allows for gaps uh, and there are no pedestrians in the intersection, you can, can of course continue to make your left turn um, as you have in the past. The only difference, of course, is this new traffic signal is showing a yellow arrow um, for that same kind of traffic movement. At the end of the phase, they'll all go yellow again, and of course, all go red. So, this is, a, I guess, another slide that basically shows the same sequence, same thing we just went over. Uh, the series on the top is what we would call a traditional five section signal. Uh, if you're driving out there today on Randall Road, you would typically see in a protected permissive phasing cycle, you have your protected green and yellow. Uh, and of course, for flashing yellow arrow, you have those two same uh, signal indications with the only difference that at the end of the permissive cycle, or I'm sorry, the protected cycle, it will actually give a second or two of red to clear the intersection before it allows traffic uh, to go through. And of course, the remaining permissive phases, um, as we've demonstrated, the only real difference is instead of a green circular indication for a flashing yellow signal head, you will see uh, a flashing yellow arrow. So I have one more video to show you that basically goes over the same uh, uh, demonstrations of flashing yellow arrow. This just shows a little bit of different uh, imagery behind uh, the traffic signal movements. Do you know what to do if you're waiting to turn left and you see a flashing yellow left turn arrow? It's simple. Be cautious and after yielding to oncoming traffic and pedestrians, make your left turn. The new flashing yellow arrow signal offers a safer, more efficient way to handle traffic turning left at busy intersections. The signals are being introduced nationwide and eventually will be required at all intersections where there is a separate left turn arrow signal. Here is what to do when you see the signal. A flashing yellow arrow means turns are permitted, but you must first yield to oncoming traffic and pedestrians. Then, turn with caution. Remember, oncoming traffic has a green light. A solid green arrow means turn left. Oncoming traffic must stop. A solid yellow arrow warns you that the left turn signal is about to change to red and you should be prepared to stop or prepared to complete your left turn if you are within the intersection. A solid red arrow means stop. Drivers turning left must stop. In Michigan, flashing yellow left turn arrows are becoming more and more common. Just remember, flashing yellow means turn with caution. For more information, 
go to the MDOT website at www.michigan.gov slash flashing yellow arrow. Okay, <clears throat> so one of the other things I wanted to cover on this slide would be what is the next steps for this project? Uh, as I'd mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, uh, this project is looking to uh, start construction layout uh, and complete construction all in this summer. Uh, so uh, the anticipated completion date uh, would be late summer or early fall. The first flashing yellow arrows are anticipated uh, to be on Randall Road between mid-August to early September. Uh, of course, these are all dates that uh, we are anticipating. Construction can always be uh, subject to delays and other types of construction um, activities. So this is just the best projections of when these types of uh, uh, completions and first flashing yellows are, yellow arrows are expected to um, uh, be present on Randall Road. Uh, besides Randall Road between uh, Fabian to Silver Glen, we are planning uh, for future projects to include the remaining parts of Randall Road, both uh, going north of Silver Glen up to County Line Road, uh, as well as uh, Randall down to Orchard. Fabian Parkway, uh, we're planning to do the entire corridor of Fabian Parkway out east uh, to the Kane County Line and Orchard Road. Uh, for two separate projects, we are going to split Orchard uh, from 88 to Jericho, which is uh, south of or uh, Interstate 88, as well as Interstate 88 to Randall Road, so the northern section of Orchard. So I guess to hit back at the beginning as to what our presentation goals were, uh, I wanted to describe where is Randall, where is this project, where is the flashing yellow arrow. Uh, for this first project for this summer, uh, this is only going to include Randall Road from Fabian Parkway to Silver Glen Road or uh, basically northern Batavia or southern Geneva to South Elgin. Uh, what is it? Uh, primarily this is uh, a project conveying the new flashing yellow arrow signal indication which uh, as I've tried to demonstrate is basically uh, the same uh, traffic operation as a left turn using a circular green uh, signal indication. Uh, why are we doing it? Um, as engineering studies and uh, engineering guidance has been updated over the years, it's been determined that this type of traffic signal is safer than the traditional method, uh, as well as the timing. We were able to get funding to uh, implement these changes at a much reduced cost. Uh, it's going to happen this summer. How will this happen? Uh, of course, through the traditional uh, uh, selection, selection of contractors. And uh, to kind of go a little bit more into depth on that, uh, these traffic signal uh, improvements will be done during off-peak hours. So as it relates to the AM peak or PM peak, if you're commuting to work, uh, there will be no construction or barricades on the road until after 9 AM and in the afternoon. Uh, when the contractors are wrapping up, there should be no uh, barricades on the road uh, after 3 p.m. Uh, granted, those are just guidelines we are trying to help keep the contractors in to uh, minimize delays to traffic, but those are uh, generally the kinds of uh, <coughs> limits we are trying to limit delays to um, all of our roadway users. So I guess I'll open up the board to questions on flashing yellow arrow or any, th any questions about the Randall Road project. Alderman Plan again. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I mean, Ms. Chairman. Chairman. Um, this is only going to affect the left-hand turn lanes as you travel northbound, correct? Uh, both directions. Both directions. So as if you're traveling southbound, Yes, yeah, so this traffic signal, I'm sorry to interrupt, uh, this traffic signal indication will be for both Randall Road northbound and southbound. Okay. Or if you're coming from the side streets, all those 
If you look on the map on the screen, you've got Silver Glen, Bolcom, Redgate, uh, Red Haw, et cetera. All those intersections with that uh, circular arrow uh, will have flashing yellow arrow both on the main line as well as the side streets. Okay. And those that do not have any uh, yellow arrows, as you say, will not have this implemented. Will it be implemented at a later time, do you think, or is it just the intersections are not safe enough to allow for the, such turns? Uh, the, the reasoning for that is that they do not currently use a permissive left turn. Uh, and to give you an example, uh, one of the intersections on here is uh, Williamsburg. That's so, a great one. So okay. that's the uh, Geneva Commons. Uh, so if you're going northbound trying to take a left, there's two left turn lanes going into the Commons there. And I guess engineering practice, when you have two left turn lanes side by side, uh, it's generally considered a, a safety concern to allow that uh, to be a permissive, to allow people to turn left uh, without a protected movement. What if you were going southbound, going to turn onto Williamsburg the opposite direction? So, again, with engineering guidelines, one, one direct, yeah. if, if one of the two directions has a protected okay. movement like the dual lefts, it does prevent <laughs> us from doing one or the other. Say. If we did do that, say if the guidelines allowed us to do that, it might confuse traffic in the other direction to say, oh, well, if they're oh, turning I left, yeah. I guess I can turn left too. So uh, I guess in that case, uh, both of those directions would be protected. They're still protected today. Gotcha. Uh, to emphasize uh, with capital letters, we're not changing how traffic moves today. It's going to move the same way once traffic uh, has flashing yellow arrows installed. It'll just look different on the traffic signal heads. And talking about the traffic signal heads, will the overheads be in addition to the ones that are stationary on, on either side? Uh, yes. So, so you're just adding those overhead ones now? So I guess uh, as part of increasing the traffic signal visibility, we're moving the signal heads to the center of the lane. But in addition to that, uh, since signal heads were traditionally like on the lane lines, there might be more signal heads after the project is completed than they are currently. Okay. So there will still be signal heads on the side, whether it's on posts or on the vertical section of the mast arms. Okay. So. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Alderman Bernal. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Sino. Uh, thanks for your presentation. Um, I, I just want to be clear here. So this. You say it'll flow the same, basically, if there's a single turn lane, um, it, there will be opportunities where sometimes when you sat insufferably while there's absolutely no traffic coming down, you'll have that flashing yellow light to, to make that turn and get off of Randall Road. So, uh, I guess the, if it operates that way today, where you, if you have a green circular indication and you want to take a left and you're sitting there, if it's currently signalized to be protected where you're sitting there with a red arrow, you will still, still see a red arrow delaying your ability to, to make a left. It's simply during a permissive movement okay. where if today, if you were to go out and drive any intersection that you're concerned about as to how it might operate differently, uh, look to see if you can currently turn left say when it's not a protected movement and it'll still work that way after the signal is flashing yellow arrow okay well my, my heart sank a little bit i was hoping to not sit in those uh, in those turn lanes for a while it will be interesting I, I get people generally adapt to flashing yellow lights but it will be interesting it seems like it seems like most of the population thinks it's the end times when there's a flashing red light so i'm not sure how uh, how adaptable people really are but uh, uh I, I trust your uh, your engineering judgment and all the research. So thank you. Uh, no problem. And uh, just to clarify, I know some of the some states use, I guess, a uh, like a red yellow signal indication. It looks almost red when it's flashing. Uh, the flashing yellow arrows that we'll be using are very much the yellow you see today. Some states use a color that almost looks like red, and um, it is, I would say, more confusing that one than what we are planning to do. Thank you. Alderman Singer, did you still have a question? Or? Oh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, 
from the uh, solid green to the flashing yellow and then the solid yellow, will those time sequences be the same in a matter of seconds, minutes? What is the sequence of time from one change to the next? Well, uh, just to best answer every question for every intersection, we're not changing the signal times as however you drive the intersection today, that the number of seconds for each phase, you're turning left into the Geneva Commons, those number of seconds, that, that stays green, it stays yellow, it stays red, those will all stay the same number of seconds. So it's not, it's the, the determination is not, it's not determined by the flow of the traffic? The traffic flow has nothing to do with the way in which the signals will be changed? It won't, it won't change differently. I can say that as a person who operates with the signals uh, on a daily basis, we do have on Randall Road time of day planning, where depending on the time of day, we use different cycle lengths or different times for number of seconds on certain movements to best, uh, I guess what you would call an optimization for traffic flow based on the time of day. Uh, but without getting too complicated into the, 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 the details, uh, I want to just sell the point that the flashing yellow arrow will not change how you drive today versus how you will drive once the project is completed. Uh, the only difference as, as it relates to flashing yellow arrow is it will look different on the signal heads. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Anyone else from the council? All right. Thank you. No problem. Next item on the agenda is recommending the approval of special event application for the Soapbox <coughs> Derby event on June 20th, 2015, and related street closures, use of right-of-way. So moved. Second. Okay, Marks and Flanagan. Any questions? Kathleen, any questions for Kathleen? No? Uh, All right. If you had a question, um, the event organizer is also here if you have questions okay. um, for him. Anyone have any questions? <clears throat> All right. So. Madam Chairman, I do have an announcement to make, though. Mr. Engelhart, Stan Engelhart and I are talking about this year's event, and the event is looking for sponsorship opportunity. So if anyone in the community, business or otherwise, is interested in sponsoring this event, I know that Stan would be more than happy to talk to you. And it's a heck of a deal, right? <laughs> Right. This is the third year for the event. Third year, that's huge. So. Yeah, All those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Yeah. All right. Next is the recommend approval of special event application and related street closures, use of right of way, and waiver of security bond, security bond requirement for Gardenology Festival, May 16th, 2015. So moved. Second. Seconded by Bruno. <coughs> Any questions? All right. Uh, let's, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Okay. Next, we have the recommended approval of the special event application related to street closure, use of right of way, and waiver of surety bond requirement for the Geneva Art Guild Festival, May 29th through 30th, 2015. Motion? So moved. Second. Okay. Simonian, second by Kilberg. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. All right. Um, next is recommend approval of temporary use permit for outdoor sales to allow food cart at 7-Eleven located at 621 West State Street. So moved. Second. Marks and Bruno. Any questions? I know I see the date. Right. Uh, oh, Alderman Bruno? The, uh, uh, to uh, Mr. DeGroot. Okay. Uh, Oh, you, you can come up too. Mm -hmm. So this is for you. You had this permit last. Uh, 
I had it, um, when I first started to do it, I, I did not have a permit because I did not know I needed to have a permit. Then um, I received a, a permit through Kane County for the health department to have a health license to do it. And this year, Justin had come to visit me and told me I needed to have a city permit, which I filled out the application and I'm requesting permission to grill my hot dogs, hamburgers, and brats in my parking lot on Fridays. On Fridays. Okay. On Fridays, with the exception on July 11th, which is 7-Eleven's birthday, and I would like to do it on a Saturday as well, just that one particular Saturday. Just before we go further, as a point of order, could you state your name and do you need that for, for this meeting? Name yes. and address and yeah, can you state your name and address? Hi, my name is Therese Davison. I am the owner of 7-Eleven at 621 West State Street in Geneva. Okay, now the, the permit uh, doesn't state just Fridays, but that's your intent with the exception of the special event. Correct. Um, the, uh, the, other, the other days that I had done last year, I did it, it happened to be on a Friday as well, but it was um, the homecoming, um, during homecoming week up at the high school. I grilled out on that Friday for the homecoming parade. I did not do it at all during Swedish, well, I take that back. I did do it on um, the Swedish Day Parade Day on Sunday, and it was bottled water and hot dogs that I sold as well on that day. And it, it, it's been very successful. The community has loved it, and I'm, I'm very proud of, of just the, the community involvement with people coming up to support me with the hot dogs, supporting, supporting our store with the hot dogs, and people are meeting and talking, and it's just, it's been a great, it's been a great success for us. That's, I just, uh, since we're trying to hash out long-term this type of permit, I was just mm -hmm. curious, is the, because we really haven't codified dates and stuff, but uh, that answers my questions. Thank you. You're welcome. And anyone else? Questions? Dean? I had a question for Mr. DeGroote on this. Okay. How many of these $100 permits do we currently have out, uh, and what do you see as a cap on these? Uh... Um, I, I don't know that we have any out this year. We have two on the agenda tonight. Um, How many did we issue last year? Then I know that there was one issued with Swedish or with uh, the Festival of the Vine. Yeah, outside of the festivals, we usually have just a handful a year that come through. Do you see a cap uh, possibly on these? Uh? Um, in, in the draft regulations we've put together, we've, we're focused more on the time frame um, for the individual permits rather than a cap total citywide. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Madam Chairman. Yeah. Oh. Um, the owners of the 7-Eleven are very dear friends of mine, so I'd like to excuse myself from this vote. Okay. So let the record show that Alderman Singer is removing himself. All right. So all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Else is <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. Very dear friends. We're all friends here. <laughs> so we're good to go? Are you going to have a demolition dog or something when the Citron building comes down? There, we should. We should do that. <laughs> a point of order is, since this is, since this is cow, this still has to be ratified at the next... Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. So actually, April 6th is your actual... Is the actual first grill date? Awesome. Okay. Thank you very much. Right. I appreciate it. All right, uh, the next item on the agenda is to recommend the approval of temporary use permit for outdoor sales to allow food cart at Joseph's Deli, located at 716 West State Street. So moved. Second. Second. Okay. Mark's Simonian coming down. <laughs> um, any questions? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. All right, item H, recommend draft resolution authorizing execution of one-year contract with option to renew with the Citywide Building Maintenance Incorporated in the amount of $86,825.76 for city facility cleaning services. Do you have a motion? So moved. Second. Second by Marks. Um, Stephanie has offered to take questions, if anyone has any. 
Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I just have a question uh, regarding the TRICOM. What percentage of that does TRICOM pay? For? They pay for their full portion. Okay. So Whatever on the in the sheet, it shows the breakout of the cost. So if you go, um, I'm sorry, I don't have that right off the top of my head. Give me one second. I tried to find it, but I wasn't yeah. very good at it. Uh, TRICOM would pay uh, 19000 a year. Okay. Thank you. Certainly. Any other questions? Alderman Kilberg? We have a $40,000 spread here between the lowest bid and the one that we're accepting. Could you give me a, an idea of some of the things that uh, uh, our current vendor has fallen short on as far as uh, providing the sure. anticipated services? Our current vendor, who is no longer our vendor, was let go because they were not cleaning. Um, they would basically come in and empty trash cans. And as we would follow up with them, they were not understanding what their duties were to be. So we terminated that contract. And that was actually the second contract we've had to terminate for not completing their services, which is why this year we went through the process of interviewing the companies and making sure we have references. And we feel that you get what you pay for is what we have learned. So the other recommendations for Warsaw, Perfect Cleaning, Eco Clean, Executive Building, and all cleaners were inadequate? Well, they interviewed executive building, all cleaners, and citywide. And after the interviews and answering all the questions and following up with references, they felt that this was the best choice. They have uh, experience with other municipalities. One is Naperville. They have experience doing police holding cells and those kinds of facilities. Yeah, you know, I could see some spread, but when you have, you're paying twice as much as the lowest bidder, it, it, uh, it does raise some concern. But uh, if that's what you feel is necessary, then uh, I guess I'll support it. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Um, the next item on the agenda, um, this was placed on the agenda as a courtesy to the Committee of the Whole to consider the appeal of the March 17, 2015 decision of the Historic Preservation Commission to deny the proposed demolition of the 6th Street School Building at 210 South 6th Street. So moved. Second. Remarks, seconded by Simonian. Alderman Singer? Yes, uh, Madam Chairman, um, I have a statement I'd like to have uh, <clears throat> recorded as such. I've received, as I'm sure many fellow aldermen have, many emails and phone calls regarding this issue. And almost every instance, what the sender or caller wanted to discuss or comment on wasn't what is what wasn't what is in front of us tonight. What's in front of us this evening is not whether we believe a library belongs at this site. We are not here to discuss the merits of the library staying on 2nd Street. It doesn't matter this evening whether or not we believe the library's taxpayers will pass a referendum to build a new library. This is not what it's the issue is about the library. This is not about the library. We're not here to discuss the possibilities of using the site for senior housing or offices. Every person on this desk is a proponent and defender of the historical preservation, so we are not here to debate the value of historic preservation to the city of Geneva. None of these topics are why we are here this evening. We are here to decide if Kane County can proceed with the de demolition of the former 6th Street School. That alone is what is being asked of us. In this past, as well as today, the city has determined that clearly the only issue that applies in cases of a demolition request is whether or not the applicant has reasonably completed or compiled with standard number one of the Secretary of the Interior Standards for Rehabilitation. We are not here to discuss any other SOI standards. They are irrelevant 
to this case. So I guess what I'm asking is that both the audience and the council stick to the question at hand. It is economically feasible and has a reasonable effort been made by the county to comply with standard number one. If we believe they have, we need to overturn the commissioner's recommendations. That is the question at hand and the only question we are being asked to answer. Um, I'd like to recognize uh, the city attorney. Yeah, I think there should be a clarification. I'm not sure what the motion is actually. The, the Historic Preservation Commission uh, recommendation was to deny uh, demolition. So this the, the city council, not this committee, but the city council has the ability to either affirm that decision, modify that decision, or reverse that decision. So, uh, and if it's a reversal at the city council level, it requires a two-thirds vote of the alderman holding office, so seven affirmative votes. So I think the motion should be clear as to whether you are seeking to affirm or to reverse that that recommendation by the Historic Preservation Commission. So you want, want us to change? I mean, I, I've got the motion. So you want? Do you want it to say to consider the reversal of the March 17th decision? Well, whatever that? your prep, but to make clear that it's it's in line with what the ordinance requirements are, either to affirm or to reverse, unless the council has some modification it's going to do to the to that recommendation. But as I understand, it, it's basically either to affirm or to reverse, and it should be in the, that kind of language so that it marries up with the ordinance provisions under the building code. Everybody clear on what I've said? Mm -hmm. uh, may I have a question? I, I know that our city council meeting, uh, our city co council agenda says reversing, but in our packet yeah. it doesn't necessarily say reversing no, so i guess that's where our confusion lies or right. my confusion lies. right and that's what i'm trying to clarify i, I noticed that the resolution that was prepared right. is for reversal and, and so uh, you know what I, i'll make I'll, I'll make the motion to change uh, the, my motion and it will be then to tie into the to what is on the city council agenda which would be considered the reversal of the march 17 2015 decision of the historic preservation commission to deny the proposed demolition of the sixth street school building at 210 south sixth street i will second that motion it's friendly amendment well yeah, that's really your who, who did the second on that it was tom so. do you agree with that i agree so your motion is to would be to reverse to the reverse HBC correct decision. because that is what the council. All right, so then it's it matches with right. what's on the agenda. Right. Okay. okay. Another point of order, um, Mr. Chair, and Mayor, Attorney. Answer. The uh, so the city council requires a two thirds majority uh, to overturn. Uh, for cow, does that is that just a popular or a, a majority, simple majority? Simple well, majority. yeah. Correct. I mean, actually, this action could have gone directly to the City Council without any intervening recommendation by the Committee of the Whole, because the ordinance says the City Council shall hear the appeal, not this committee. So that's what I think Alderman Cena was saying. This item is on the agenda at this committee level as an accommodation, as a convenience, so you could uh, discuss the matter. But ultimately, it's at the City Council level to make the decision okay and, and ordinance and, and it th to answer your question <coughs> the two-thirds vote does not is not applicable to so the we, county we, we don't even have to vote tonight then or no, not correct no, no, no. Uh, the, and, and that uh, that ordinance speaking of ordinance so the ordinance would have defined uh, that hearing before City Council at the next regularly scheduled which would be April 6th is that correct so this this special city council was done as a courtesy to the petitioners? No, no. The, the ordinance, if you may, the, the code says within 30 days after <coughs> such an appeal is made, and as I understand it, there was an appeal made. Last Wednesday, right. the 18th. Okay. By the applicants for the demolition permit, and 
I believe the mayor, city administrator, de determined to have that decision made as promptly as possible with the special city council. Okay. But the April 6th would have met the letter of the, of the ordinance in terms of being within 30 days? Yes. True. Okay. Thank you. So... It's, any you, other comments about this? Well, topic? do you have a presentation, David? Um, I just I just wanted to provide a, a quick background and then turn it over to the applicant to, to make their okay. appeal. They have a, a short presentation they'd like to share with the committee tonight. All right. Um, I think we've we've touched on some of this, so forgive me if I, if I'm repetitive. Um, just a little history on the building. The Sixth Street School building was constructed between 1924 and 1925. Um, the gymnasium addition on the west side of the building was added on in 1939. Um, the architect for the building was Frank Brownfield Gray. He was an architect in the Fox Valley region for more than 30 years. Other known buildings in Geneva include the Island Park Pavilion and then his home and office located at 909 South Batavia Avenue. The Sixth Street School is one of two historic schools remaining in our historic district. Um, the 1999 architectural survey identified the building as a significant building that adds distinctive character to our downtown. As such, it was identified in the 2012 downtown master plan as a building that should be preserved and explored for adaptive reuse. Last week at its, uh, at its meeting on March 17th, the Historic Preservation Commission denied the applicant's request to demolish the building. The commission determined that the request did not meet that first Secretary of the Interior standard. Um, in particular, that other adaptive approaches to the building might be possible and warranted further exploration. Uh, the commission also noted that the costs outlined for the rehabil rehabilitation of the building were reasonable for a building of its age and construction, and cost estimates seem cons consistent with probable market value of the rehabilitated property. I want to note that the chairman of the Historic Preservation Commission is present tonight, Scott Roy, if you have any questions on the, on the commission's determination. <coughs> um, as was pointed out, a supermajority vote of the, of the city council is required to overturn that decision. And then Michael Lambert is our preservation planner. He's also present this evening. And of course, I'm available for questions as well. Um, but first, I think the, the applicant wanted to make a presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, Madam Chairman, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, members of the council, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for the invitation to speak tonight. Uh, my job tonight is to introduce our request and the team of people who are here to answer your questions. We want to be thorough, but we don't want to wear out our welcome. So with your permission, it'll be short for me and then to our expert architect and then questions and answers, uh, whatever you'd like us to do. Would that be all right? Yes. Okay. Um, here are the four people, and I'm going to ask uh, them to rise uh, when I introduce them. Uh, number one, we have John Martin. Uh, if you'd rise, John. You know, here's the good looks and brains of the county board who represents approximately 22,000 people in this area. He replaced Mike Donahue after he retired and is the former managing partner of a top-notch law firm in Wheaton. We're very lucky to have uh, John on our uh, county board, and I thank you for all your good work. Um, Don Biggs, if you'd rise, please. Uh, director of facilities, served in the United States Marine Corps for six years, rose to the rank of sergeant, sergeant and has uh, decades of experience managing facilities uh, most recently in charge of building out $120 million uh, in DeKalb School District. Uh, Don has, uh, has us marching forward, uh, but tonight he's a little under the weather. He's been fighting off uh, something that's being medicated for about a week now, 10 days. Uh, next, we have Brian Cronwitter. He's a professional architect with Cordigan and Clark. He helped us prepare a 272-page report that was submitted to the Historic Preservation Commission. Cordigan Clark has successfully uh, completed the new Aurora Public Library, major buildings at Aurora University, and the recently christened Field House at Wabansi Community College. Uh, thank you, uh, Brian. And then finally, Pat Del Santo our very own superintendent of Regional Office of Education, and she is uh, and her staff are our current residents at the Sixth Street School. 
very intelligent lady, most pleasant to work with. You know, the city of Geneva and Kane County enjoy the best relationship with each other as good neighbors. Uh, we are proud and grateful for our association with you, and we thank you very much. Kane County also appreciates and respects the role that each group plays in the process of providing local governance. The Historic Preservation Commission protects older buildings. The Geneva City Council makes decisions for the benefit of the entire community. Our county board has reviewed several appraisals of the Sixth Street School by professionals in this area. Uh, they have concluded a range of value between $1.2 million and $1.8 million. In the rep uh, report prepared by Corden and Clark, it shows it will cost $3.7 million to bring this building just up to code. Uh, in a way, and I say this respectfully and with affection, this building is like a car that's been totaled. Uh, when it costs substantially more to repair a car uh, than its appraised value, you have to replace it. In order to properly use this public asset, we have, uh, we have to demolish a building whose rehab would cost more than its appraised value. Brian Crone Ritter uh, has a short presentation of just five, six slides, but to put some of the meat on the bones of the $3.7 million to bring up to code, that again is twice as much as the building uh, is appraised, here's a list from Pat Del Santo of basic and expensive concerns about the building. Uh, we're not whining or complaining. We're grateful for the facilities that taxpayers allow us to use. This is just full disclosure. Uh, the roof has major leaks. Uh, there is mold. Uh, there's asbestos. Uh, we have humidity issues. The parking lot would require a lot of repair. Drainage, including drain pipes, uh, not attached. Uh, doors don't properly close. No elevator. Uh, no hot water. No drinking water. No lunchroom. The HVAC. Uh, temperature control is not reliable or consistent. We have bricks falling uh, from the building. Uh, and sorry to even need to mention this, but we have rodents. Um, bugs year round appearing in the building. Electric fuses blow, poor ventilation, ceilings uh, beginning to sag. Uh, the air conditioning and windows don't fit, covered with garbage bags. The carpet needs to be replaced. Uh, but there's asbestos underneath, which you know uh, makes it much more uh, expensive. And then finally, uh, the building is not ADA compliant. So enough of the gory details. We ask you to give us permission to prepare this property for future use. We honor the past. This building has served its purpose well. Uh, but now our focus, and I hope your focus, is on the needs of the present and future. Our grandparents, parents, and friends put this building to good use. Now we are preparing for the use of this valuable location for our children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. Our entire King County Board unanimously supports this request to you. But we all recognize that the authority to make this decision rests with members of this body. So may I have your permission to ask Brian to quickly present his five to six slides. Would that be all right? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Brian. Thank you all for having us. Um, just uh, some of the, the highlights. Uh, the report was in your packets, if anybody had a chance to see the 272 pages, which has a lot of graphics in there. I'm not going to get into all those. Just some of the brief history, uh, which was mentioned by uh, Mr. DeGroote. Uh, the county did purchase the facility in 89 and has been using it for administrative offices. Uh, minimal maintenance has been uh, accom accommodated by the county through its, uh, its, its ownership. ROE is a regional office, only occupies about 50% of the building, and they are scheduled to relocate. Uh, there is a current purchase agreement in place with the library. Uh, this is really the meat of the rationale for the demolition. Um, the building is not required or desired by the county for any administrative offices. Uh, bullet number two, uh, which is really uh, one of the more important ones, is the building is underutilized with only half of it being used by the ROA and is a financial drain to operate the facility uh, by the county. Uh, bullet three is regarding the asbestos and there's an underground storage tank also that needs to be remediated. 
we have bid that work. It is uh, approximately $150,000 worth of remediation work. One of the uh, criteria was to look if the building could be relocated, move it, pick it up, and move it somewhere. Obviously, that is not financially viable. As uh, Chairman Lawson mentioned, there are significant life safety and ADA compliance issues with the facility. It is a three-level building where you enter into a, at a half level, and there's no ADA uh, elevator to access the three levels. There are significant exterior envelope issues. The masonry and steel and roof have major issues. The mechanical, electrical, and plumbing systems uh, need to be replaced completely. The fire alarm system needs to be replaced. And as Chairman Lawson mentioned, the estimated cost, just to bring it up to code compliance and normal modern standards uh, without any additions, would be about $3.7 million. And the third bullet, or the final bullet, is that is about three times the current market value of the property. One of the requirements uh, in the, uh, the um, application was to look at potential reuses. This is zoned as a special use uh, within the, the, the city. So there are only these um, uh, types of facilities are uses that could be potentially um, put into uh, that uh, either existing facility or demolition of the facility. Uh, I'll just uh, briefly go over those. Agricultural uh, re would require the, uh, demolition to put the uh, ground back into agricultural use. A cemetery would require demolition of the, the facility. Community housing, uh, based on you know, national trends and national averages for square footage, uh, would, would indicate this uh, Facility is not adequately sized to be financially viable. Uh, assisted living is not a compatible use for that area. Uh, senior housing usage, again, uh, it's inadequate square footage compared to national averages, which would indicate it's not a financially viable option with that current facility. Potential museum or gallery could be used there if there was such a, a demand. Uh, challenges with that is are the uh, floor loads uh, for the existing structure are only 70 pounds a foot. Most uh, modern museums and galleries would require 150 pounds, so that would cause some significant challenges for anybody interested in doing that. A library here was another possible usage. Again, there are four floor load limitations. Uh, it would require a significant addition, which would limit potential parking on the site to get to a 60 to 70,000 square foot building of a community the size of Geneva. A three-story building with many small areas creates excessive operational costs, and the excessive renovation costs versus new construction makes it a very challenging op uh, option. The next uh, usage uh, would be schools, uh, a charter school, elementary or high school or college facility. Again, all the, uh, um, the size recommendations for such facilities in today's times are much uh, larger. So this does not make uh, that site uh, economically viable for any of those institutions. And then nursing home, park and rec, fire and police, uh, again, are either no demand, no need for such a facility, or they're incompatible uses. A telephone exchange or microwave tower, again, is an incompatible use for that neighborhood, as well as a waterworks facility. And then a convent or monastery or church or temple are also potential special uses. Uh, which would require demolition, and there doesn't appear to be any demand for those types of facilities in the area. That concludes the presentation. Thank you. Uh, can we, uh, would he feel a question or two? Yeah. At this sure. time, or do you go want to ahead, come back? Alderman Kilberg. However go you'd ahead. like to do it. Why don't you go ahead and ask while he's sure. up um, here. Would any of the deterioration of the building, could that be tied to uh, neglect? In other words, the county took ownership in 1989, and over the last 26 years, uh, has the county uh, reinvested in that facility at all? Because we have buildings in Geneva that are 90 years old that are still very functional. So I'm just wondering if neglect might have been a contributing factor to the deterioration of this building. The county did put new windows in the in the facility and has done so, have have done some uh, minimal maintenance to the project um, to the facility. Some of the things are inherent structural issues, uh, which are from old buildings. They they have issues. Uh, the roof uh, needing replacement. It's it's at that stage in its life where it needs to be replaced. Um, 
other things, asbestos. Again, you can get get along without taking the asbestos out as long as you. In other words, draw. my question is: then, it's, if there were investments made in that facility over the last 26 years, would the condition of that building be better than it is today? The obvious answer would be yes. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, Alderman Bruno. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the the Three million and change number. Do you have any sense, or do you have any breakdown as to what is attributable to the main structure versus the additions? Tim, do you have? Excuse me. Tim Weber is my. Uh, he might. He did a lot of the legwork on that. Uh, our report is basically uh, broken up by deficiency and uh, code review comments. Uh, we did not actually separate out the repairs for the addition versus the existing building. Yeah, when I was going through the, uh, uh, well, I, I attended the historic preservation meeting too, and the um, uh, and went through the packet. It seemed like most of the deficiencies uh, sit with the additions. Uh, in fact, I think even in the meeting. Um, uh, you're saying windows are fine, could use caulk, uh, and, and the roof might need attention. It, it seems like most, uh, it, uh, it might be valuable to separate those two portions because they're of different value. I think the only uh, deficiency on the list that directly attributes to the addition being the gymnasium is the uh, settling that we're seeing on the uh, could you speak in the microphone, please? Yeah, sure. Sorry. That's all right. The, uh, the only item on the deficiency list that is specific to the gymnasium is uh, we, we did experience uh, or we saw some settling on one of the elevations where the uh, foundation would need to be jacked. And, uh, you know, I think that in terms of the roof in that area, that particular roof is experiencing the same drainage issues that we're seeing across the entire building. So I would say that the only item on the deficiency list that I would say is specific to that would be the settling of that foundation. Thank you. Anyone else while these gentlemen are up here? Okay. <coughs> Who was someone going to speak next? Okay, all done. Been taught brevity is the soul of <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. I had a question then. Yes. Uh, our, our regional superintendents here. Uh, this building was occupied by the superintendent's office for the majority of those 26 years. Is that correct? No. You need to go. We've been there approximately 10 years. Prior to that, it was occupied by the health department and by court services. Okay. Your first year there was? I'd have to go back and, and specifically look, but I, I, we've been there about 10 years. Is, uh, the city housed staff, or the, excuse me, the county housed staff there over that period of time. As regional superintendent, would you, uh, I guess my question would be health, life, safety, based on the roughly $4 million worth of improvements that have been outlined that uh, would need to be done to bring the, the building back to a functional level. Mm -hmm. As regional superintendent, if this was to be a schoolhouse. I would close it down. Okay. So the county then had their employees working in an environment then that really wasn't our ideal. standard for our standard for children is is much higher than our standard for adults I understand that but, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it seems that there is somewhat of a double standard there that we expect employees to work in an environment that is less safe than where we'd send our own children to school so that's the only point I wanted to make thank you okay, thank you Alderman Bruno. Uh, thank you. If, I, if I'd have known you were done, I would have kept the floor. A um, uh, question for uh, Mr. DeGroot. The, <clears throat> did we, it's my understanding that we received an inquiry from a developer uh, for adaptive reuse for that? 
of no, course. This, this, we have, this not pertaining to what's on the floor? So. Well, in terms of uh, the Secretary of Interior standards, oh. um, you know, have uh, you know have adaptive reuse options been fully exhausted? Thank you. Should I answer? <laughs> I mean, to, to answer the question, we haven't received inquiries specific to that property or this property, the Sixth Street School. We've received inquiries um, for opportunities in the downtown area and, and inquiries regarding just larger buildings in general in the downtown area that could maybe be adaptively reused for housing. Thank you. Uh, that's all for you then. The, so I, I look at this and we need to consider, first of all, the HPC, I think it, it's, it's foregone uh, how they had to vote. The Secretary of Interior standards were, were pretty clear. Um, uh, when, I, when I was in attendance at the uh, Historic Preservation meeting, uh, I, I got the very clear impression that with the exception of the additions, uh, the primary building is, is pretty sound with, with not nearly the, uh, the requirements for rehabilitation as those additions. Uh, the building is apparently not a danger to occupants or residents. We do have residents, or we do have occupants in that building now. Um, there are, you know, we, we've had inquiries. There are adaptive reuses for these types of structures. Um, in fact, its current use is an adaptive reuse. Uh, what, what gets me the most is the peti petitioner... There, there's no plans for what will replace this, and I, I think it's it's. But that's not what we're here to talk about. Well, well, right. But I, if there was any resident, every every resident in the historic district, every property owner, um, uh, has to follow this the same process. There's there's no favoritism given to any other taxing body. Uh, you know, we we have people run the gauntlet for to to remove a structure. Um, and that usually includes what's going to be replacing it. Uh, again, we don't have a building that's uh, a, a danger. Um, it is clearly historic. Um, and, and if we look at our own mission statement, first two points in our uh, in Geneva's uh, vision. Uh, we honor and preserve our community heritage, heritage and character. Number two, the unique, unique character and vibrancy of our business district place it amongst the most desirable destination. Uh, those efforts have made us the envy of communities far and wide and created an economic engine where most cities struggle with withered and uh, dying downtowns. There may actually be development plans that would warrant the removal of this building, uh, but, but we haven't seen them. There could be development plans that will bring great value, but we haven't seen them. Um, I think it would be antithetical to the values of what Geneva uh, has for managing that character, particularly downtown, to, uh, to eliminate a building when uh, there is no planned project, um, and, and so far as we know, it could be years and years away. Uh, some see this as a 16-year-old or a 16-year process that's gone on, um, and it just needs to be brought to a close. I, I get that, but for I think most of the residents, most of the feedback I've gotten from uh, my constituents. Uh, is feeling that this is this is pretty rushed because it was it's only last six days ago when the decision to uh, to save it was brought up and challenged. <clears throat> uh, denying demolition now doesn't preclude demolition later, um, but un until until such time as we kind of have a sense for there's going to be greater value brought to the city, I. I I can't see voting to support demolition. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So uh, I'm going to piggyback off of what Alderman Bruno started with or hit on at some point. Um, 
We honor and preserve our historic character. I don't remember the exact words, but I agree with the sentiment completely. We do honor our heritage, but that doesn't mean that it exists in a snow globe unchanged forever. I honor my father, but I am not my father. Um, I think what we have here is a case, as we sometimes run into, where the community has conflicting goals and objectives. Um, no, we're not supposed to talk about the library, but the 300-pound elephant is going to talk about the big elephant in the room. What we do know is this. The county is the current property owner, and they're petitioning for demolition of the building. The library has a contract to purchase this building. They support the demolition of this building. Those are facts, not conjecture, not maybes. We may have an adaptive reuse. We may have inquiries about this, or we may not, but I have two uh, certainties. Um, the thing you said about this being a 16-year project actually goes back farther than that. That same body, this is the third time that that body has identified this site as being ideal for, the, for their future. Uh, the first time was in the 80s. and 89, they sold the building to the county and opted to expand the building that they're in now. Uh, a few years after that, when I got on the board, we determined that that building would not sustain our needs. So we went down that path again. Right. Then I came here for 12 years, and we went down that path a third time. I'm really As, that's fine. Bang away. It's hard to talk about this without some context. You want to talk about the building in a vacuum? We can do that. It's full of asbestos. It's falling apart. If I go in there and sneeze, it'll fall well, down. Well, I think we've heard that. Um, so I'm sorry. It is, it is some context. If, if we can talk about the potential reuses, I can talk about a potential use, too. And that potential use has some evidence behind it. Fair enough? Well, Madam Chairman, the potential reuse will be decided by the 1004 Special Review, which is handled by the Plan Commission, Understood. the Historic Preservation Commission. Understood. So, again, our, and I thought the Chairman did, said it eloquently, as did Mr., you know, the, the folks from the county. This is about the building and raising the building, pure and simple. Okay, but, so I was just addressing Mr. Bruno's comments. Right. He, put, he put the inquiry into potential reuse on one side. I put this potential reuse on the other side. Because what we I'll have done successfully that. is we have allowed for, encouraged, and in some respects abetted mm -hmm. the raising of another building about six blocks away without consideration of what might go in its place. Mm -hmm. We did that well. I think we should do this equally as well. Equally well. Just to preserve the process. So, um, so I have to get back on track. <laughs> um, so I, I agree with that. We also see a list here of, of all the permitted uses within the current zoning. And, and yes, there are adaptive possibilities within some of those reuses, but those adaptive possibilities come with a pretty hefty price tag, a price tag that sits currently at three times the worth of the building. Uh, it's not clear to me that if we put that much money into that renovation that the re recovery of those costs would be dollar for dollar. So basically we're saying to whatever entity does whatever with this building within those permitted uses, you're carrying a pretty hefty cost burden in order to do this within an existing box that's built, that was built in 1924. That existing box is something of a stretch to see how that construction, that layout, that wiring, that configuration adapts easily and conveniently to modern uses. Um, so there's the cost factor. There's also the uh, you know, what type of quality building you have at the, at the other end of that. You have a building that looks one way from the outside, but whether or not it um, lends itself well to the purposes of a modern pick your use of out of that list is, is a whole separate question. Um, so in my mind, when I look at that list, I see, I see a bunch of uses that we've identified within the current zoning that really become difficult or impossible with that building in place. When I think about our vision for the community, which includes preservation as one of its cornerstones, but also includes several of the uses on that list as key to its vision of the future, 
I see uses that become difficult, if not impossible, with that current structure in place. So although we do not know what the exact plans are, what the exact drawings would be, we do know that the body that attempts that adaptive reuse is going to do so under a pretty hefty cost burden and a, and a construction burden that may end up precluding its ultimate best use in the end anyway. Um, I do not <coughs> lightly consider not going with preservation first. But in this case, I think those reasons highlight exactly why we have to reverse the decision. Thank you. Alderman Cummings? Um, to Mr. To Alderman Bruno's point, I think if any other organization came in here and said, we have mold, we have rodents, I'm assuming by rodents that they meant rats, maybe they're woodchucks, maybe there's something equally innocuous, but I'm guessing that they're rats. We don't have hot water. We have significant leakage in the roof. Um, we wouldn't say that that's habitable by children or adults. Uh, I, I can't agree that this is a um, building that I would want to work in, nor have anybody else work in. I'm curious what the maintenance costs and utility costs are for the building. I've heard some pretty high figures. The average maintenance cost we've been spending is approximately you, over 100. The average maintenance cost we've been spending on that facility is over $100,000 a year. Last year we only spent $50,000 on that building, anticipating moving forward with the demolition of the project. Uh, the electrical bills are one of the higher electrical bills of the, uh, the county. Um, again, the heating system is it's unoperable. We struggled this year to get through the winter with the heating system. It's an old system from the 1940s. So that right alone is over a million dollars just to replace the heating system in the building. Thank you. <coughs> if, if a private entity came up here and said, we want to roll the dice with our own money and we're going to pay three times what a building is worth to renovate it, I'd say, have at it. You know, it's your money, roll the dice, I hope you make money. If you don't, it's your, it's your money you lose. As a taxpayer, I cannot support that sort of gamble. Can't, absolutely cannot support that sort of gamble. Thank you. <coughs> Alderman Simonian. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, a couple things. Um, forget about the library, forget about all the rest of that stuff. I'm just... Uh, to me, it's a simple solution. As I read here, it say this. It says. Okay. Any better? <laughs> um, the standards are applied to projects in a reasonable manner, taking into consideration economic and techn technology feasibility. <coughs> in my simple mind, this is not does not support economic feasibility, number one. Two is, I've seen, I see all the uh, plans from the county or the engineering group uh, on the adaptive reuse. And um, the cost to renovate this And I have to go with what is uh, is shared with me. I don't see anything from HPC negating any of this or any dollar amounts that they feel it would cost to uh, bring this up to code. So I've got to go with what is presented to me, and that's uh, it, I feel it meets the standards of uh, uh, not being economically feasible and the adaptability part of this equation. There's nothing in this list that I consider is adaptive. And uh, as a businessman, I'm a, I agree with Alderman Cummings. I wouldn't take this risk. And I don't think the taxpayers uh, 
want to continue to pay this burden, especially when we don't know how long this burden is going to last. Number one. Number two is we as a city have control over what's going to be built there. So we do have somewhat control over whatever is going to be built there. Um, and I think we can accommodate the master plan through that process. So I'm in favor of demolition. Anybody else? Alderman Bruno wants to speak again, so I just want to. The floor. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, which is why I brought up the point of uh, the additions versus the primary structure. Uh, sat through the whole HPC meeting, and the general feeling was talking about the main structure, there, it sounded like an argument for renovation. Uh, maybe it was just the way it was presented, but when I went through the packet, uh, if we, uh, yeah, I think it would be important to segregate the less valuable additions from the primary structure. So I, I don't think those uh, those costs, which were done on paper, um, might really have much uh, basis in in reality. Thank you, okay. Alderman Flanagan. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, as with all HPC issues it seems to be a struggle for me um, I understand both sides I can understand uh, where um, the historic preservation comes <coughs> from um, but I can't continue to think that taxpayers keep paying for this building over and over and over again it just keeps hand you know one tax pa taxing body sells it to another taxing body we pay for it then we sell it to another taxing body and back and forth and just on that alone, I think the building has really uh, outused out, uh, used its usefulness. And so with that, I just think that uh, it's about time that we just uh, reverse it, reverse the HP. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else from the council? Madam Chairman, can the question be called? <laughs> no. Boy, you're impatient. We still have, uh, the community still has the opportunity to speak. Is it Mr. Lambert, did you want to? Anybody from the audience? If you come to the microphone and state your name and your address. Hello, my name is Chad Jurdy. I live at 525 Fulton Street. We're uh, half a block down from the schoolhouse. Um, I think the, the, the thing that we struggle with is that, I, I, un, unless I'm mistaken, I don't think the property's been put up for sale or actively marketed. And I don't see how it could be, they could have fully explored the opportunity for adaptive reuse of the facility. And it's an uncertain future for the lot. Once it's demolished, we lose a historic property. And we're never going to get back. And we're staring at um, a vacant lot now for you know, the foreseeable future until the future of the property is determined. And we would like it to go to public use. Um, and, you know, maybe it's a library, maybe it's not. But it seems like this is a premature decision from the point of view of the community. And I think I speak on behalf of my neighbors as well. Thank you. You want to just go row by row? The Kilburn. Yeah. <laughs> Sophie, blonde, scarf. <laughs> I'm Carolyn Jurdy. I also live at 525 Fulton Street. Um, one of the things I would like all of you to remember is uh, we, we faced a similar challenge with the Pure Oil Building, where we were told it couldn't work, wasn't doable, it was too expensive. Uh, there were all sorts of hurdles to that that all of you heard. And look at the outcome when we looked at all the alternatives that were possible and what a beautiful space we have now. What a beautiful place that is in our community. And I love the idea of looking down the street from me a year or two years from now, however long it would take to develop that, and to have the same sort of thing happen. So please don't be too premature. Please look at all the options. Please uh, be thorough. We can't get that history back. We can't get that building back. We, 
uh, we would miss it dearly in our neighborhood. Thank you. I've. Can, can I we jump in here, or you want to go through? You can jump in. Yeah. I I too thought about pure oil. The difference is pure oil is is generating zero dollars for the person, the group that decided to keep that. And if someone, a private entity like private bank, maybe they'll step up and say, you know, we will, we will buy this building and we'll get rid of the rats and we'll seal the roof up and we'll leave it empty and we don't care if we get a return and that's fine. But the, the pure oil building is, is essentially a shell right now. I love it, but that took, took a fair amount of money to step in, rehab a building and then just let it sit, keep the maintenance up and that sort of thing. But there's no one renting that, anything like that. So if that were to happen to this building, I'd be okay with it, but I have to say I think the odds are about as close to zero as they would get. Nobody's going to buy the building, fix it, and walk away from it. And that's, that's the difference I see with the pure oil, with this versus pure oil. Could I, could I add something to that? Certainly. Also, Pure Oil is a private ent entity or two. So whatever they were able to do, they were able to play with their profit margin. If this property is, in fact, going to be for public use, the cost of that adaptive reuse is going to be borne by taxpayers, everybody here. That changes the complexion of the picture a little bit. So I, I'm not saying it's impossible. But keep that in mind. If we want public use to get that adaptive reuse, there is no profit margin to play with to make that happen. It's pure cost pass to the taxpayers. Thank you. Uh, Alderman Bruno. That would uh, go on the presumption that it is a public entity that acquires that property. I said, right, but right. we heard earlier that they would like it to be public use, right? So if that's true. So I'm just balancing things out. <laughs> White shirt, tie. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> just trying to keep things moving. Hi, my name is Jeff Golden. I leave at, live at uh, 328 uh, South Fifth oh, Street. Sorry. My name is Jeff Golden. I live at 328 South Fifth Street. I work in Chicago, and I got to say, living in Geneva is incredible. When people ask me where I'm from, and I say Geneva, instantly people say oh i love going downtown i love taking the train out there i love going out there on a saturday and walking around the downtown area and to alderman bruno's point that that's what draws people that's what our town has that other towns don't have and when you start to take away these buildings our town doesn't have that anymore it's it's gone now if you take away the sixth street building that's that's not going to be gone for geneva but the more of these that start to go away that does start to happen. As I mentioned, I live on South Fifth Street. I moved there uh, about a year and nine months ago. I wanted to move into the historic district. Every place that went for sale, my wife and I went through there. We went through, I don't know the address, but the Patton House was a home that was for sale. Everything that you're saying is wrong with this building, with this building, was wrong with the Patton House. I couldn't go through the house. It smelled so bad in there. I got sick to my stomach, and I had to walk out. I'll guarantee you there's rats in there. The, the, the roof was certainly destroyed and flooded. The building was an absolute disaster. How many times have I had dinner there now in the, since it's opened up? Probably six to ten. It's incredible. That can happen with the Sixth Street building. We have to give it the opportunity, though. And if we rip it down, that is never going to happen. Keep going back side of the room. Uh, my name is Scott Roy. I live at 1231 Castro Court, and I'm chairman of the Historic Preservation Commission. And what I was hoping is everyone would speak and uh, cut my presentation in half, so um, so it's not as as large as it as it was going to be. Um, one thing I'd like to say is that the presentation that you guys got on um, 
the application for demolition is a lot different than the one that we got um, last Tuesday. Um, pretty much the presentation was um, the county is underutilizing the building and wants to sell it. To sell the building, he has, the county needs to approach <coughs> other government bodies to see if they're interested in it first before they can take it out to the public, to the open market. Um, we didn't hear about a contract that the library board had on the, uh, on the property. We heard that there was a first right of refusal. So I don't know if there's a contract or not. Um, so the library board has an option to purchase the property, uh, which goes back to the 1980s, and they would like the building demolished. The conclusion was we need to tear down the building. <coughs> so all those other adaptive uses that say demo required, demo required, demo required. Yeah, that was not part. I mean, we went through the report and oh, talked gotcha. about it, but yeah. Sorry, that was the presentation. Right, gotcha. Um, uh, Mr. Laws had talked about a bunch of appraisals that they've had done. We had a letter from a commercial real estate broker that identified three properties, wide, ra wide range of different values, and so it should be worth $1.1 million. So we didn't see any appraisals as part of that report. We didn't see what state the comparables were in. Were they in the similar um, condition as the existing building, or was it? Um, after investing 3.6 million into it. Um, so that's what started when we came in. The next question was, have you looked outside? Have you looked at other options for um, someone else that might be able to use the building? And it kept going back to the library has an option to purchase. And so they want the building demolished. So that's what we want to do. So the item one of Secretary of Interior Standards was not even considered in, in that presentation. It was primarily this is the this is the road we're going down. So um, so we didn't have appraisals. We didn't have have that. Um, and unfortunately, we spent a lot of time talking about the library too. Uh, people from the library board were there. They spoke about it. Um, so we kind of got off track and spent a lot of time talking about the library and their programming and and really just the conclusion there was that there, the old building was not considered at all for uh, for a new library, whatever that what that might be. Um, so what we felt was that the county didn't put together a good enough case to warrant that it should be torn down. Um, they didn't look outside. They didn't look to the public. They were going down a singular path that said, "This is going to the library is going to buy it. This is what we need to do to to accommodate the library." Um, they looked at some of these uses, and some of these uses might be feasible if the zoning was different. And I think that the community would be open to rezoning the property if a, an acceptable use became available. Um, so. Um, and then when we talk about the cost, and I'm not quite sure how how this works, but um, we talked about asbestos and that uh, there's asbestos in the building. It's going to cost $150,000 to get rid of the asbestos. When we talked about the demolition, which costs about, a, I think they quoted about 450000 to tear the building down, we need to remediate or get rid of the asbestos before we can tear it down. So. That hundred and fifty thousand dollars is a cost, no matter what. That is going to have to be borne by either the library or um, or the county. Um, the total cost to demolish the building is um, four hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars. We should look at reinvesting that into the building rather than just using it to tear down the building. Um, Alderman Kilbert, you were talking about maintenance issues. A lot of these. A lot of these issues have to do with deferred maintenance, and uh, and it is what it is. That's what what it is right now. But um, there has not been any investment in that building over the last couple decades. Um, the next thing is that we tear the building down, we put a new building up, 
you're going to have to have new bathrooms. You're going to have to have a new roof. You're going to have to have, you know, you're going to have to have new HVC system. You're going to have to have new electrical. All of this stuff that wasn't factored into this three point three point six million dollars in in renovation. So if you build a new building, you're going to spend a lot of that money already. You may have to spend a little bit more to retrofit the existing building, but you're going to spend money on all of these systems that they're talking about. Um, the report also stated that primarily the structural issues have to do with that uh, gymnasium addition. And so um, maintaining or, or retrofitting the existing building, there's no there's no structural issues that we would run into in that case. Um, what I think is that the county kind of presented to us because they thought it was a done deal, didn't have to prepare too much and just uh, go through the motion to make it happen. Um, so, and the other thing is it comes down to is um, how long is it going to take to after we tear it down? How much how much time is it going to take for that's going to be a lawn, and uh, it could be a very long time that that's going to be a lawn. Next, people start getting used to having a lawn there, and then they start um, looking at maybe we want to keep it a lawn going forward. So, and I think my concluding comment was. Um, one of the, the, the downtown master plan that was put together said that that was an ideal opportunity for redevelopment and uh, hopefully retaining that building. And uh, that plan was put together by the city and by the, uh, the residents of the area. And I would just hate to see five years from now when we revise that plan that we're playing with a lawn rather than um, a historic building that uh, that we've already talked about. So those are all my comments. Thank are there you. any questions for me? Yes. Um, let me see if I got this right. Uh, you're uh, are you not opposed to the demolition versus the demolition now? Um, I would. I'm opposed to the demolition now because I think that there is still utility left in the building, whether it's for a public or private use. I, th I think that that building could be used. Maybe it can't be used as it stands today, but with an addition, with some type of rework, with some demolition, targeted demolition, I think that, that there's a viable use for that, the property. So if there, if uh, let's just say we take the uh, library piece out of the equation mm -hmm. and um, uh, one or two other folks uh, approach the city or the county with regards to potential yeah. adaptive use and they come back and say no way we're not spending that kind of money on that would you have a problem demolishing it then um, I think what I would have a problem with it but I would like to see their case on what they have in, in store for that lot or that property and what they would like to do with it. See, that's, th that's the problem I have is that, mm -hmm. and uh, no disrespect to HPC, but everybody on HPC is, is a staunch advocate of historic preservation. I'm for that's, historic that's preservation. That's why we were appointed that way. Pardon me? That's why we were appointed. Oh, I know. And, and you're going you're gonna to tow, th tow that line, which is fine. Mm -hmm. I'm, I support historic <coughs> preservation, too. But uh, I believe it. When I just asked those two questions, mm -hmm. your answers on all of them were, I don't want it demolished, I don't want it demolished, I don't want it demolished. Right. Well, I mean, we're, we, I think we have a different role here, um, and that is that we have to look at weigh the historic preservation with the uh, citizens or taxpayers' um, interest as well, representing 22,000 people, not necessarily whatever, right. uh, you know. So uh, with all due respect, I'm just curious to see if, if there was dem demolition in any of your scenarios, and it doesn't sound like demolition is any well, part of that scenario. Uh, city staff put together um, some data for us from 2008 to today. Mm -hmm. um, we have actually approved the demolition of 16 buildings in the historic district. And um, you, you haven't heard about any of those because they put the applicant put together a good case. They 
put it all together and they convinced us that either economic feasibility or uh, a new use mm -hmm. uh, was not viable for that property and so we approved the demolition. The only two that have come to City Council have been the Pure Oil Building and this building. So we are not, um, we are not anti-demolition. We're anti-demolition for a building that has a viable reuse. Okay. Thank you. Any thank other you, questions? Chairman. Anybody else? All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Blue shirt. <laughs> I'm Adam Gibbons. 33 West 777 Hill Road, Geneva. Okay. Just want to point out that the building we're now sitting in was built in 1912. And <laughs> we're sitting here because the city of Geneva decided over the years to put money into it. The library was built in 1908. So to tell us that, you know, this building has no possible adaptive reuse because it was built in 1924, I don't believe it. And the county clearly has you know, neglected the building since, well, for years now. I'm a county taxpayer and, you know, t for them to just admit that they haven't put enough money in to just do yearly maintenance, much less, you know, needed repairs, doesn't make me very happy. So my advice would be for the county to sell the property with the building existing on it and let the new owners decide what to do with the building rather than tearing it down and just, you know, rushing this all through. There's been no postings for the public to participate uh, in such a discussion. I just don't want this to be rushed. So those are my few comments. Anybody else from this side of the room? Other side of the room? Thanks. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Mike Hellman. I live at 516 Franklin Street. Uh, the front of our house, we can see the 6th Street uh, school building uh, from it. Um, I need to see your name. Simonian. Simonian. Uh, Alderman Simonian. Um, while I understand uh, as um, a city council member, you represent the whole of Geneva, not just um, the historic district, which seems to uh, comprise much of this room tonight. Um, but what I, and, and your concern over taxpayers is, is certainly uh, well taken. Uh, but where are all the people, the taxpayers, that are in support of demolition? Where are the taxpayers that are here tonight to say that they want this building torn down? I see an awful lot of people, and you didn't stand up, but I see an awful lot of people in this room um, that are residents of this area that uh, live directly near the 6th Street School, and uh, those are the people in the room tonight with concerns. So, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else from the audience? Oh, sir. Uh, Al Oxner, 627 Campbell Street. I'm the same way I see the place too. Uh, my feeling, I, I like the, stu the school and I think, and I like the historic district. It's great, but I'm not wedded to it. But I hate like heck to, to, to be sitting there for I don't know how many years looking at a prairie. And that's when we had a prairie ac across uh, 7th Street. Before they, before they built the condos. That was the prairie. And all that was was a place for, for raccoons and uh, uh, a garbage dump. And I don't want to see that spot as a garbage dump. But I, I'm not wedded to that building. I don't have, uh, I, if it has to be torn down and something put up, put up there, great. If they tore it down, built housing in there, fine. I don't care but I don't think the people want to see a prairie. Thank you. Thank you. So, no one else has anything? Oh. <coughs> Corey Ann Campbell, 18 South 6th Street. I've spent nine years in that building from kindergarten to eighth grade. I certainly have sentimental feelings about it and walked through it today. Um, nothing fell on my head while I was walking, 
and I didn't go through the floor either, and I didn't smell anything, and nothing ran over my feet. But I would like, I, I have strong feelings, and I support HPC, and I support the history of this community. I do have a specific request, um, and that is that if this building goes down, I hope that those who are doing the demolition will save the cornerstone, as was done at Coal Trap, which has artifacts in it, and I would hate to see that just trashed. It's on the northeast corner, if you don't know where it is, 1924, school district, and I forget what we were, 98 or 89, it's not 304. I also have classmates who tell me that we buried some time capsules in that same northeast corner. And from what I can gather, it was probably in 1954, which would have been the 30th anniversary of the building. So if it ultimately goes, I hope that some of those things which are historical can be preserved. We shouldn't trash it all. And as you know here, did the time capsule and the things are exhibited here. So that's my request to whomever. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Colin Campbell, 18 South 6th Street. Uh, I am so ambivalent about this. I've always wanted to see the library up there. Uh, Mr. Maladra would, uh, Alderman Maladra would probably confirm that we were in a planning session years ago at the high school talking about the downtown shuffle uh, and moving the library out to that property or Citron and uh, the city hall being able to take over the library and so on and so forth. Very much in favor of that. Um, I have a request and a prediction. And I realize that that is not going to be part of the motion. I realize what you're doing, but I just want to state this. That if the building comes down and if the library is built, that they build a library, a building that is compatible architecturally with the history of the district. Maybe copy one of the old Carnegie libraries, something along that line. But my prediction is because of the tax situation uh, in the city today, uh, and particularly with the school bonds coming due in the next several years, that the building will come down, we will have an empty lot for 10 or 12 years, there will be no bond issue voted or approved by the city and ultimately the library will sell it to a developer and we'll end up with condos. Check with me in 10 years, see if I was right. Thank you. Ms. Gaines. Jones. Yes, I'm Sharon Jones, 521 Franklin Street, Geneva. And I'm kind of following up on Colin's comments here. Um, I just like to think of us at the big picture look that we've talked about for many years. Um, it, it is standing in this building now long term is going to be our cultural arts center, right? The city will take over use of the old library. The library will building a new building, perhaps in the 6th Street School neighborhood, that will accommodate the type of library <coughs> that is necessary for the future of our citizens, not like we have seen it, you know, historically. So I really kind of think maybe we have a better chance of reaching those long-term visions of keeping this building intact as we had anticipated years ago as a cultural arts center where the plays can come back here again, the film festivals, all of this. But the city really needs room, okay? You guys coming down to see, come in with Sherry Weidel and, and then Paul Evan, all of this. I think maybe having the library seriously evaluate that 6th Street building as it could be used as a future library, might have a better chance to pass a referendum in the next couple years. Historically, no. Th that building was not built to structurally to hold up books. 
but the future of the libraries isn't all books anymore. We have Batavia Library that was built during the period of time, that decade, when the book was the primary source for citizens' use. We all go to the Batavia Library. We all go to the St. Charles. We are like Tri-Cities. Uh, the library here and the new administrator is fabulous at this library for understanding what the future library needs. So I would like to draw upon those expertise with this day and age to look and see if that building, some of those <coughs> classrooms, some of those could be used for the technical, the administrative. John, you really can't talk about the library. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, all right. We got it. Okay. So big long-term picture. Keep that in mind. And... Um, I think do not tear it down right now, but to give a chance for it to be reevaluated in the long term. But don't just tear it down right now. Okay, thank you. Thank you. you. All right. Anyone else? <coughs> Sir? My name is uh, <coughs> Jim Bishop. I live at 228 South 5th Street. So I'm about a half block away from, uh, from the building. Um, nobody's brought up what will happen to this building if the county moves out of it. And I guess I'd ask Mr. Lawson, will you be moving out of this building regardless of whether uh, the, uh, the, 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 the sale takes place? If, you're not, if it's not demolished, will you stay there? Is that known at this point? Um, with, the, with the cost of the redevelopment, uh, you know, the, the 3.7 million, um, I can't see that happening, but I haven't given the kind of uh, consideration to that, nor consulted with 24 board members who unanimously uh, support the request for this. Right. right. So I don't know is the mm -hmm. frank answer to your question. Right. If the county would move out of this building, I think we'll see a rapid decline of this facility. We've all admitted that, th that it's gone downhill quite a bit over the last uh, 20 years. And it's going to go even faster when it becomes empty. Uh, somebody would have to step up, take ownership of the building, and uh, maintain it. Who's that going to be? So that's something to keep in mind as you decide whether you're going to keep this building or not. Anyone else? <coughs> Anyone else from the council? All right. Uh, could you reread the motion that's on the floor, please? Uh, Consider reversal of March 17, 2015 decision of the Historic Preservation Commission denying the proposed demolition of the 6th Street School Building at 210 South 6th Street. So I believe we need to call a roll call vote. So point of order, so a, for clarity, uh, an I vote would support overturning. <coughs> Correct. Yes. Thank you. I vote would support the demolition. Okay. Okay. Mike Bruno? Nay. Donald Cummings? Aye. Dorothy Flanagan? Aye. Dean Kilberg? Aye. Craig Maladra? Aye. Richard Marks? Aye. Tom Simonian? Aye. Ron Singer? Aye. Mary Sino? Aye. Passes 8 to 1. Uh, point of order, I'll just leave. Mayor vote on this? Mm -mm. This doesn't require, this is a committee. The com committee of the whole. This is a committee of the whole. The mayor is not required to vote. And For what it's worth, I do support the reversal of the agency. Okay. My vote doesn't matter either way. Uh, moving on to item J, recommend draft resolution authorizing publication of updated City of Geneva zoning map. So moved. Second. Marks, second by Cummings. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Are we good? All right. All right. 
Recommend draft resolution authorizing execution of easement agreement for electric utility at 2535 Soderquist Court. So moved. Second. Second by Simonian. Any questions? You guys are on fire. <laughs> no questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Should I wait for him to come back? Should I wait for him? Okay. All right. Recommend draft resolution authorizing execution of easement agreement for electric utility at 2570 2600 Caneville Court. So moved. Second. Mark. Second by Bruno. Uh, any discussion? All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, we're good. All right, item M, recommend certificate of acceptance for Peacock Engineering Facility Expansion, Duke Realty Limited Partnership. Motion. So moved. Second. Tony and second by Marks. Any discussion? <laughs> Seeing none, hearing those, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. And recommend draft resolution authorizing a professional services agreement with Baxter and Woodman in the amount of $23,250 for 4th Street parking lot project. Second. Maladra, seconded by Bruno. Any discussion, questions? Seeing none, hearing none. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Okay. Item O, recommend draft resolution authorizing execution of contract modification 11 and 12 for Walsh Construction Company totaling $7,628 for an overall contract amount of $4,618,645. So moved. Second. Okay, Bruno, seconded by Flanagan. Yeah. Any Action. questions? All right. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Okay. Um, just wanted to find out if this was going to be last of the uh, modifications, or, or do you think we'll have some more? There will be at least one more contract modification, which will be a final material and quantity change once the project has been completed, but we're really really hoping that this is it and this will be covered by uh, the original agreement or is this something we have to pick up or as before with the previous contract modifications once the project has been completed and closed out by the city we will then have to modify the intergovernmental agreement with metra for a final payout and recompensation uh, thank you alderman marks you got the questions anyone else all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, item P, recommend draft resolution authorizing payment to Union Pacific Railroad Company in an amount not to exceed $20,315.64 for flagging operations associated with Third Street Commuter Deck Expansion Project. So moved. Mark. Second. Second by Simonian. Any discussion? Is this this is our cost correct or is this this one is this wow wow <laughs> this was not included within the contract as create crafted by Metra it is staff's intention to seek reimbursement by Metra to cover these costs okay thank you anyone else all those in favor aye, aye. aye. thank anybody you anybody opposed okay new business Uh, upcoming meetings, we have the regular Committee of the Whole on April 13th, 2015 at 7 p.m. Do I have a move to So adjourn? moved. Second. Second. Second by Marks. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It's a resolution. Yeah, it's a resolution. It's a resolution. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but, no, but you do. 
Yeah, we're going to. No, you're City, city Council. Okay, that's not wages. Council. You got to switch here. I'll go for it, yeah. Okay. That's not wages. Without delay, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen we'll uh, begin the City Council meeting. The meeting is called to order. Let the record show that all the aldermen, save for Alderman Brown, are present. Alderman Singer, where are you? You're needed. <laughs> Alderman Singer. Alderman Singer, you're needed at the dais, please. Let the record show that my power has weaned. <laughs> Alderman Singer. Mr. Singer. This is a special city council meeting. We have one item to consider. Consider resolution number 2015-21, reversing the, determina the determination of the Historic Preservation Commission to deny the demolition of the 6th Street School building located at 210 South 6th Street. So moved. Motion by Marks. Second. Seconded by Singer. Comments presented earlier this evening at the Committee of the Whole. Obviously, we're considered. We can certainly consider similar comments tonight, but out of respect to everyone, we ask any new and germane comments be brought forward as opposed to repeating what's already been said. Alderman Bruno. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor and uh, Madam Chair. Uh, with respect, I'd offer this. Uh, whereas our ordinance would have normally scheduled this item to be heard by the City Council on April 6th, and whereas a matter of this import would have uh, more time for the consideration of the City Council and public, and whereas there is no time-sensitive project involved in this matter, and whereas I've gotten resident feedback that feels this hearing has been rushed, and whereas uh, the other affected ward alderman, Mr. Brown, is absent this evening, I would move that the subject item of this special city council meeting be tabled to the next regularly scheduled city council meeting of April 6, 2015. A motion to table does require a second. There's no debate allowed. Second. This has been seconded. A roll call votes in order. A simple majority rules the day. Mike Bruno. Aye. Donald Cummings. Um, aye. Dorothy Flanagan. Aye. Dean Kilberg. Aye. Craig Maladra. Nay. Richard Marks. Nay. Tom Simonian. Aye. Ron Singer. Nay. Mary Sino. Nay. In this instance, half the aldermen have voted in favor of the motion, and that requires, uh, allows the mayor to, to vote. And I will vote nay on the motion. And I will also state, if I may, he was am I permitted to speak now yes. that the motion has been defeated? No. Okay. Uh, I'd like uh, to call a division of the House, please, because we have nine aldermen. How can we have a tie vote? Half of the aldermen voted. Uh, so I can bring it to a half of the aldermen voted for the motion. So mayor allowed to vote either. Thank you. Time. The main motion is back on the table, folks. That motion is to reverse the decision of the Historic Preservation Commission that was offered by, I believe it's Mr. Marks, seconded by Mr. Singer. Questions or comments from the audience? From the dais. Hearing none, seeing none, Madam Recording Secretary, please take the vote. Just as a note, this requires two-thirds of the alderman serving office. That requires seven affirmative votes to deny and reverse the HPC decision. Mike Bruno? Nay. Donald Cummings? Aye. Dorothy Flanagan? Aye. Dean Kilberg? Aye. Craig Maladra? Aye. Richard Marks? Aye. Tom Simonia? Aye. Ron Singer? Aye. Mary Sino? Aye. The motion is passed. Eight affirmative votes, one nay vote, one absent. We move on to item two. I would entertain someone to make a motion to waive the fees normally paid to the city council for tonight's special Second. meeting offered by Simonian, seconded by Singer. Is the voice vote sufficient, Mr. City Attorney? Yes. Voice vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Any new business under the special city council meeting? No meeting next week. No meeting next week. That's, That's correct. Who knows that? <laughs> Motion to adjourn is in order. So moved, so moved. Motion by Simonian and seconded by Alderman Marks. All in favor say aye. Aye. Microphones are off. <laughs>